Hello, and welcome to HiMax Simulator Walkthrough Training Module 05. In today's module, we will shift focus from the vehicle of the first four modules, the Type 12 Gun Griffin, over to the vehicle that will be the primary focus of the American HiMax pilots, the VW-1. On the surface, these two machines seem visually identical. How different could they really be? Well, we will soon find out. Here is Mission 1 again. But oh, what's this? The boost bar is replaced by a fuel gauge. And the RP is now a rocket pod. Not to mention, where did the Apache come from? Now, 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 let's slow down, rewind, and establish, as we did with Type 12, the right mindset. The first thing to really mention, and the root of the V1's differences, lies squarely in the nation who uses it. As you will remember, the HiMax program was a joint US and Japanese development but the final products here have been adjusted to suit the needs of two very different countries. The Type 12, being Japanese, is oriented more to ground unit focused formations, with emphasis on the CCV for commands and an RFV for more radar use and sensor coverage. Now Japan does have a large air force, but not one quite as large as the world's biggest, the US Air Force. This is one of the primary reasons for the large differences in the respective units. One is designed for large combined arms, air support based operations, and one is focused into more specialized units that need to take care of their own needs. Let's move on to the actual examples now. First off, the weapons of the VW-1 are primarily the same. The Type 12 automatic 120mm cannon, the large caliber MG, and the ATM are all identical, and as such will not be gone into detail in today's module. The first obvious difference is RP. Unlike the stacked grenade system of the Type 12, the US VW-1 has opted for a more traditional hydro-rocket derived system. These fire a stabilized but unguided rocket at long range, in bursts. A single hit to enemies, or even close by, will usually cause total damage to the vehicle or AUGs present. However, their lack of a true spread means for hitting aerial units they require more precise aim. What they do have in common with the Type 12s is you should not fire them at close range or you will regret it. This is where things get a little more obviously different. You no longer have a full-on radar. Instead, you merely have a designator. It functions the same for calling in air support, and here you should also begin to pick up on the big differences with the VW-1. It has no major onboard radar suite. Important note. It does, however, have a simple proximity warning indicator for nearby enemies. This might seem even more odd, but will quickly make sense. Moving on, this leads to one of the most important differences of the VW-1. On the map box, you will notice a gain level. While in dense cover or foliage, this signal drops, and you are slowed. If you ever find yourself out of fuel and outside of signal range, your movement might slow significantly. Keep this in mind, once again, this seems odd, but pay attention, it will come together soon. As you also might have already noticed, the VW-1 does not share the Type 12's boost bar. Instead, now having a fuel gauge. To initiate a jump, use your jump button. But notice it now takes up a section of fuel. In total, you will have enough fuel to engage in 4 to 5 jumps. After this, you must resupply at a helicopter to refuel. So what is the logic here? What's the point? Why offload the sensors? Why tie the movement of this machine to other units? Why use this finite jump system? Why use traditional rockets? And overall, why are you now assisted by an Apache helicopter? The answer is simple. Because now you can sustain your flight. Yes, now you can soar for a smaller specific fuel cost per second. Which now remember what we first mentioned, the US versus Japanese doctrine differences. Here it should all click into place. VW-1s are deployed in the simulator alongside Apaches, because VW-1 and Apache are both part of the same American HIMAX units. They are both in the same composition, as they both perform a mobile anti-armor role. Notice, in the two missions where you saw them before, they were always accompanied alongside Apache helicopters. 
This is because the Apaches in the squad can provide a Fetter radar coverage with their longbow radar arrays. The need for HIMAX to mount ultimately shorter, inferior internal radar to take up internal space, which is a valuable commodity, is now offloaded. So now, with the freed up internal space, more can be focused into fuel and higher output sustained flight. With that in mind, we can now see the different doctrinal approach all come together. The Apache acts as the eyes and ears of the unit, focusing on its superior radar coverage to pick out targets. From there, the VW-1 can now focus on its job as the hammer of the combo, bringing to bear its powerful weapons. And now, thanks to its internal fuel stores, what is impossible for the Type 12, long, powered flight, becomes a reality for the VW-1. So here, where the Type 12 pilot still needs to often parse and do sensor analysis, stop and wait for the boost bar to recharge, that job can be left to the Apache pilot and co-pilot. The AUGS pilot can now focus on spearheading the attack. And thanks to its aerial position, it now has a far higher mobility than the Japanese RFEs. Consider this. The Type 12's offensive ability is constantly limited by what enemy targets are in range and detected by the slower RFE units. Remember back to missions 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11? Keeping radar units alive was incredibly vital, and losing your RFE could mean the loss of the mission. Here, the Apache not only has superior range, but superior mobility as well. So we can see the American priorities and doctrine reflected in the VW-1's machine. Air superiority and control. Combined arms units focusing on their job. The Apache scouting for the fast VW-1, which kills targets. Fuel and cost are not as much of an issue, as the US will always take pilot safety and performance, even at a higher price. So in short, you can see and feel the difference. JSDF HIMAX units are primarily ground-focused and designed for independent and less supported offensives where air support may be non-existent or questionable. Endurance and hit-and-run are more useful to their composition. The Type 12 is generally very capable, but has drawbacks and is more tied to its slower RFE. American US Armed Forces choose to make the HIMAX units oriented for combined arms, air-dominant integrated attacks where more specialized and mobile units prevail. Endurance is not an issue with American supply chain abilities and logistics. The combined attacks of the VW-1 and Apaches make the radar and the attacker role more mobile and capable. More specialist, perhaps, but also more aggressive and destructive for blitz attacks. Let's shift now to something that will become common in these later modules, our quick comparison section. As you can see, the general weapons and ammunition are more or less identical with the exception of the swapped rocket pod. The sensor range is obviously non-existent on the VW-1, as it has been offloaded to the Apache wingman, reflecting the difference in sensor setup down to doctrine. In terms of raw speed, the ground speed of the VW-1 is slightly higher at 150 km per hour versus the Type 12's 146, and the airspeed of the VW-1 is 273, noticeably faster than the Type 12's. Here we can really see the difference in engine and power output differences from the US's higher priority on more power and speed at the cost of more intensive fuel usage and endurance. Now let's move to the real comparison, the missions. Here we won't go through a full playthrough of each level, as the Type 12's walkthrough has already done so. Instead, we will quickly show off how the VW-1's markedly distinct setup changes things. For example, let's simply compare Mission 1. An experienced pilot will complete Mission 1 in the Type 12 and then VW-1. In the Type 12, the completion time of the mission is somewhere around 2 minutes. In comparison, the VW-1's blitz ability brings that completion time down to around 1 minute 20 seconds shaving off 40 seconds, a full third of the time needed to complete the mission. That is the speed and power of the VW-1 in action. Moving on, as expected, Mission 1 and 2 are still a complete annihilation of the enemy. Their uncoordinated and largely unsupported formations are very easily wiped out. 
now even more so with the increased hostility of the VW-1's abilities. You may also notice your Apache taking pot shots with its cannon. While it can fight, do not expect it to take down the enemies for you. That's your job. The first bumpy mission is Mission 3. It's a bit rough as it shows how the American setup is not as adaptable to the JSDF approach when it comes to a detached operation. Here, with no support helicopter to use to refuel, and in the cramped urban environment, the VW-1 has to be far more conservative and defensive with its boosts. That being said, the enhanced radar coverage of the Apache makes up for the relative weaknesses of the VW-1, and so this mission is more awkward than difficult. Mission 4 is the first real rough mission, and first mission that shows off a more dramatic difference. The highly forested terrain, combined with the fact that huge swaths of AAA roll in, mean the joint setup of the VW-1 is at its weakest here, because if the Apache is destroyed, your radar and your awareness in the dense forest is essentially gone, as is most of your movement. Important note. You can command your Apache via the Datalink system. Remember, zoom in twice. If you feel it would be in harm's way, tell it to hold position or to circle around a combat patrol point. It would be easy to blame this seeming failure on the machine, but remember, this campaign was designed with a Type 12's doctrine in mind. As such, this is in some ways inherently an unsuited mission for the American style of approach. Against AAA formations, it would not be mixed AUGS helicopter squadrons covering jets, it would be US Air Force jets firing high-speed, anti-radiation missiles first, in a suppression of enemy air defense role. Only then would the Americans deploy AUG squads to push in. Here the difficulty is more so now from how this mission is set up, and it grates against that. That being said, it's still not a truly difficult mission, merely one where you must account for the VW-1's more min-maxed approach to attack. Mission 5 is unsurprisingly perfect for the VW-1. This all-out blitz attack and follow-up battle with returning troops is exactly the kind of role the VW-1 was even further specialized for. Hit hard. Hit fast. Level the enemy armor, backed up by your air support. Mission 6 here as well, if played in the offensive manner, specifically highlights the VW-1's strengths. However, as before, mind the aggressive AAA. The destruction of your Apache will hinder you greatly here, as in Mission 4. Mission 7 brings out once more the ideal use and role of the VW-1. Here, the huge bonus from the Apache's radar helped the allied formations stay aware and target enemies well beyond their visual range. And unlike the hit-and-run flanking of the Type 12 needed here, the VW-1 is designed to fully push in in one hard strike. See here as the pilot cuts into the enemy's armor formation, giving them no time to react and essentially beheads the main mass of their attack and, ironically, the enemy VW-1s, leaving the allied armor to deal with only the stragglers left now unsupported. Mission 8 here perhaps is one of the toughest for the same reasons as Mission 4. The Northern Formation's aggressive anti-air Tunguskas in their huge quantity pose a massive risk to your Apache. Have it hold back instead. Likewise, the limit on the supply helicopter's presence and dense foliage means you must play more conservatively and let your enemies come to you. You must ration your fuel and boost smartly. Will you try a risky cut into the enemy's formation? When will you do it? What will hold you back? Mission 8 is all about you having the ball when it comes to your decisions. And unlike the generalist Type 12, the specialist VW-1 here will make those decisions far worse if miscalculated, or far more effective and devastating to the enemy, if properly timed. Also, make full use of the UAV to support your efforts. Mission 9 here involves aggression, and once more it will show the strengths and weaknesses of the VW-1. The Apache's further sensor range means you have a much stronger ace up your sleeve when it comes to your awareness, and are not so limited to the RFV. Budgeting your fuel and boost here is the really primary issue. Outside of that, this mission has large clusters of relatively undefended enemies. See, here in the beginning how the pilot is using a slower march uphill, 
so as to save fuel for a more destructive boost later on. See still though that he keeps the RFE alive, and is on the ball, clearing out the enemies. The VW-1 takes some heat, but quickly sweeps the entire landing area of the second helicopter waypoint. Even the Antonov can't take a break, and the Jag Panther are stormed so quickly they actually accidentally destroy themselves by attempting to fire their rockets while climbing the hills just seconds after touchdown. This is the fierce power of the VW-1 at its best. Mission 10 will see a general repeat of the same points. The huge benefits to awareness and allies that the Apache's radar brings. Careful budgeting of fuel and timing for helicopter resupply. And leveraging the VW-1's raw speed and power to tear into enemy formations before they have the chance to really attack. Not to mention, this mission's constant helicopter supply means you will always have fuel to take advantage of. So whereas the Type 12 needs to wait for the enemy to come to it, the VW-1 can leap out and hit them first while returning with time to spare. Which leads finally to Mission 11. Mission 11 is once more the ideal use of the VW-1. Massive attack, heavy armor presence, and a heavy anti-armor role for the VW-1. The main thing that will challenge you here is the fact that huge presence of enemy air units means your Apache will likely be quickly shot down. But then again, you will likely repay that many times over to the enemy brutal crabs, VW-1s, and their own Apaches. With that HiMax Simulator, Walkthrough Training Module 05 comes to a close. Bonus tip. Using the left and right arrow keys in the Special menu section will allow for you to switch cosmetic skins on your chosen vehicle. There is a large selection. Try it out. Next time, we will be looking at the partner to the VW-1, the Apache Gunship Helicopter Module.